Welcome to today's webinar entitled The Importance of Participation, Rethinking Clinical Trials. This webinar is the third in a special series of four webinar trainings leading up to the fifth annual Genetics Day on the Hill, which takes place on Thursday, July 15th. However, this series is an excellent opportunity for any individual interested in proactive advocacy surrounding hot topics in genetics and health. So if you're not going to be joining us next week, um, this is still a great webinar for you. Um, my name is James O'Leary. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Genetic Alliance. Um, and I want to do a couple updates for those of you registered for the event. Um, you should have received email updates from Andrea Cornell with details about the logistics of the event, the series, and also a link to frequently asked questions. But if you need to see any of those details again, um, you can look on our website at geneticalliance.org slash geneticsday2010. So with that, we'll get started with today's webinar, which will focus on rethinking our approach to clinical trials on a national level and helping to formulate our message for Capitol Hill. Unlike some of our other topics, clinical trials is an area where we're not necessarily recommending a specific bill or regulation. And we'll hear from our speakers today that will help us determine some of our talking points. Um, but also, it's, this is really an opportunity to educate Hill staff um, and to really help find champions going forward to help us make the changes that we want on a national level, both in terms of policy but also ongoing regulation as is needed um, for this changing field. Uh, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today. Uh, who will share their knowledge about clinical trials participation and innovative ideas on how to reimagine or uh, change the current uh, system and models. Uh, first, we'll, we will have Doug Petticord, um, Executive Director from the Association of Clinical Research Organizations, as well as John Lewis, Vice President of Public Affairs. That will be followed by Dr. Susan Love, President of Dr. Susan Love Breast Cancer Foundation, uh, and then finally, we hope to have Ben and Jamie Haywood, co-founders of Patients Like Me, join us today. We'll conclude our program with time for questions and answers at the end. Um, just because we have so many speakers, we do want to get through uh, each of their perspectives. Um, bios and slides for today's presenters can be found on Genetic Alliance's website at geneticalliance.org slash webinars. Um, and a reminder to our participants, you are on mute during the call. Therefore, if you have any questions or comments at any point, please type them into the comment box on the right-hand side of your screen. Genetic Alliance staff will collect those questions and then we'll ask some of our presenters on your behalf at the end of the program. So without further delay, I'll turn things over to our first speaker, uh, Doug Pettiford. Uh Thank you for joining us today, Doug, and we're going to switch over control of the slides to you right now, and I'll let you know when we can see them. Oh. Uh, we can see your slides. Thank you very much for joining us. Very good. Thank you, James, and, and, and good afternoon to all who are joining the call. Um, very quickly, I am Doug Pettacord. I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of the Association of Clinical Research Organizations, or ACRO, and I'm joined today by John Lewis, who is ACRO's Vice President for Public Affairs. Um, quickly, ACRO is made up of research organizations that specialize in the conduct of clinical research, primarily in the conduct of clinical trials, um, though we are indeed involved in research activities that, that precede and follow the conduct of phase one through three or phase four clinical trials. Um, our companies today are involved in about half of all clinical trials that take place worldwide. We are, we conduct clinical trials primarily for pharmaceutical and biotech companies that's, that are developing new drugs and new treatments although we are increasingly involved as well in clinical trials that are sponsored by NIH and other federal agencies. Um, our companies have more than 70,000 more than 70, research professionals in 115 countries. And last year, those professionals were involved in trials that involved more than 2 million participants. We view, I'm, I'm pleased to open the webinar 
webinar today, um, we view the issue of um, patient participation or volunteer participation in clinical trials as central to the development of new drugs and new, new treatments for the people that need them. We see that that participation as, as related to at least sort of three legs to the stool of what drives participation. First and foremost is the question of access, and that's access which ideally is driven by information. Susan and Jamie and Ben will actually talk a lot more about the issue of um, providing access, making connections between patients or volunteers, participants, and physician investigators, and making those connections in both directions, allowing patients to find the appropriate investigators and investigators to find the appropriate patients. The other two legs of the stool from our perspective as companies that are involved in research um, actually include simply the question of the size of the population which, to which clinical trials are made available. Um, as you may know, participation in clinical trials among the adult population in the U.S. is quite low, depending on the survey that one looks at, somewhere between 3 to 6 percent of individuals have been involved in clinical trials. Um, in other populations, for instance, in a pediatric oncology population, that figure may be much higher. Um, in ACE, though, if we are limited only to, for instance, the population in the United States, we will be looking at a percentage of, of participation across 300 million people or so. If we expand that population to include Western Europe or the entire European Union, we'll, we will be looking at a population that's twice as big. So for us, the issue includes the question of the greater a, a, a size of the population from which one can recruit appropriate patients for appropriate trials, the better. And certainly, um, greater population in, in, increases or, or speeds the development of new products. Um, the third leg that we see, and this is where we're, we're going to present on today, is the issue of the percentage of investigators, physician investigators that are involved in clinical trials, like the number of patients, um, the percentage of investigators is, in, is quite low. Um, we're in the 4 to 6 percent range of physicians in the United States are involved in clinical trials at a, at, at a given time across their careers. Um, but in fact, um, the, the principal way for an individual to be recruited into a clinical trial, made aware of a clinical trial, um, is in fact through their physician. So for us, the issue of what motivates physicians to participate or to not participate in clinical trials is very much an important question. And what I'd like to do now is turn the microphone over to John Lewis, um, ACRO's Vice President for Public Affairs, to talk about a survey that we did of uh, investigators just recently. So, John, thank you. Thanks, Doug. As Doug mentioned, uh, ACRO is really focused on the investigator uh, portion of the recruitment equation more so than, than the direct patient recruitment um, piece. And here is, is part of what motivated us to, to conduct this survey. Uh, when looking at uh, the pool of investigators globally, we see uh, decreasing numbers in the U.S. and in Western Europe, the traditional or established markets, if you will, well, at the same time, we see the number of investigators increasing rapidly in Central and Eastern Europe, Asia, and, and Latin America. We actually expect that over the past uh, few years, China, India, Korea, and Singapore. We don't think the increase is, is a problem in these emerging regions. In fact, we very much encourage it uh, for the reasons Doug mentioned, but we see the decrease in participation in North America and Western Europe uh, is very troubling because it's a real missed opportunity to not take advantage of the, the medical infrastructure and the trained investigators in, in these sites. So from the ACRO perspective, we want more physicians participating in research everywhere. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of the investigators uh, in our survey. The survey covered uh, about 200 active investigators, uh, approximately half in the U.S. and half in Western Europe, 
uh, and we also surveyed about 100 uh, either former investigators, meaning they've not done research in the past year, or, um, or uh, uh, physicians who had never done research. And this is just a, a snapshot of the investigators. So when we asked why, uh, when we asked the investigators why they did research, um, these were the results. And advancing science and providing better treatment to their patients were the leading reasons. Financial considerations uh, were less important, although if we looked at a breakout here, uh, it was much more of a factor in the U.S. than in Europe. And there are a number of reasons for that that um, we won't get into uh, today. So. What were the challenges uh, that the investigators faced? And, and not surprisingly, uh, one of the major ones was patient recruitment. So that's why we're, why we're all on the call uh, today. And you'll hear more from uh, Ben and Jamie and Susan about uh, new models of patient recruitment. Time constraints, regulatory challenges um, are also a big uh, uh, challenge for the current investigators. <clears throat> if we look at, um, if we turn to the non-investigators, and we asked them why they didn't participate or um, how interested they were in participating. And there's really good news here that 95% um, of physicians at least had some interest in participating in research, and 59% were very interested. So then we'd ask, well, why haven't you participated? Um, again, we have a lack of time cited as a major reason. That's not something... Uh, we may necessarily be able to address um, specifically, although we think we can educate physicians better about uh, the actual time commitment it takes and how to balance that with the financial benefits of, of being an investigator. So we see an educational component here. But also striking is the fact that 39% of these uh, willing uh, physicians had just never been asked. So, that, so we clearly need to do a better job of of outreach also and of bringing more physicians into the uh, investigator network, if you will. So why would these um, non-investigators, these physicians who have not done research, what would encourage them uh, uh, to participate? They cited increased compensation as the, the primary reason. Um, and again, we think this is an educational issue because if you uh, recall back on the um, uh, the slide on the profile of investigators, we showed an average per patient of about $3,950 uh, per patient. That is a uh, general number across all therapeutic areas and across the U.S. and Europe. If you look at uh, specific therapeutic areas uh, like cancer, which is very high demand and a very difficult area to conduct research, the fees can actually be much higher. We also tend to see higher fees in the U.S. Um, some other separate research that's been conducted shows that, at least in the U.S., uh, the clinical research can translate for physicians into about $400 per hour um, uh, in compensation, which is, which is quite a bit better than, than a, uh, a normal practice. So there are lots of reasons, um, educational reasons here we need to um, um, educate physicians about not just the financial opportunity, but how to actually manage a business of participating in research. So if we turn back to investigators, uh, what, makes, uh, what makes trials more difficult to manage is the question we asked. And again, not too surprisingly, uh, regulation uh, was the major issue. Clinical trials are and should be a uh, highly regulated uh, uh, endeavor. Um, and we want to look deeper into this issue to see if we can pinpoint and gain some clarity around specific regulations um, that perhaps can be streamlined. We actually think one of the biggest issues here is if we just had more clarity and consistency of regulations across, uh, across geographies and across uh, funding sources of research, that would, that would help greatly. Um, interestingly, liability concerns, um, this was a bit surprising to us, um, liability concerns were, a, uh, were seen as a, uh, a, a deterrent to participation. Um, and the real striking finding here is the difference between the U.S. investigators and Western European investigators, perhaps not surprising given the uh, legal system in the U.S. and, and, and the movement toward tort reform. 
Um, this is a bit troubling to us because the reality is clinical trials are not viewed as risky from a malpractice perspective. Uh, in commercial trials, industry-sponsored trials, there is indemnification provided uh, uh, to the investigators, so they have uh, very little, if any, liability. So this is really a question of a perception of risk that may be deterring uh, physicians from participating in research, and we need to do a better job, uh, first, of educating them about the real uh, liability that, that is presented here or lack of liability that is presented here, and then secondly, working on our uh, on the legal framework in the United States so that it is um, uh, less onerous uh, and there's less of a perception of, of risk. <clears throat> we asked some questions about conflict of interest, and, and we actually thought that uh, Pure conflict of interest policies might be a larger factor in uh, deterring people from, from uh, research or from physicians abandoning research, particularly uh, among some academic uh, institutions. Part of the, part of the conflict of interest uh, discussion uh, is in the area of uh, income disclosure or what's been termed uh, physician payment sunshine. Uh, just a, a moment of background here. In the healthcare reform legislation signed last year, the Physician Payment Sunshine Act was included uh, thanks to Senator Charles Grassley. Um, his intention was a good one. He, he, wants to incur, he wants to discourage improper payments from industry to physicians and to shed more light on those, uh, but we think he goes too far. Uh, and these numbers by themselves may not seem very significant but uh, as far as a deterrent, but if you look at the U.S. component specifically, we have 24% of investigators saying they will be less likely to participate in research or won't participate at all if their income is disclosed. So we view this as having basically a quarter of physicians who participate in research uh, at risk um, because of these disclosure laws. Um, we question, uh, ACRA really questions whether legitimate payments for legitimate research should be included in these disclosures and we really think we need to balance out uh, conflict of interest rules and, and payment disclosures from needs of research to continue um, uh, the interest in, in uh, research. Let's do another barrier. <clears throat> this would be insurance coverage of the actual participants, not of the investigators, but of the actual participants. This is feedback from uh, investigators. And it, not surprisingly here, insurance coverage is much more of a factor in the U.S. Uh, than in Europe. With health care reform, uh, we'll have 30 million more Americans included in insurance coverage. Uh, we think that will help in patient recruitment as it brings these folks into the, uh, the medical system rather than, than acute care or emergency room care. Um, and there was also a uh, provision in the health care bill from Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio that, that uh, said insurance companies cannot deny coverage for routine care for people who participate in clinical trials. Uh, ACRA worked with Senator Brown on this legislation and we strongly endorse it. Uh, the problem is, as, as many parts of the uh, health care bill, there's a delayed implementation and this provision does not actually take effect until 2014. Uh, we're hopeful that the insurance companies will uh, adopt this practice sooner as they have with some other provisions. <clears throat> now, we asked the question, um, do you agree or disagree that keeping up to date on clinical trials is easy? Um, and the results here are disturbing as well. It, it's difficult for physicians to find information uh, on clinical trials. We also know it's difficult for um, uh, participants, uh, for patients to find information on clinical trials. So we've got YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Um, social media is increasingly being used on patient recruitment, but it, we, we're really having trouble getting the word out to physicians, and we've not been able to bring them into the fold yet. So we asked for some recommendations about how they would improve access uh, to, um, to information, and this was actually one of the stronger recommendations, one of the more uniform recommendations that we found in the survey. Uh, is to uh, the development or improvement of a comprehensive uh, marketplace. So we're really talking about clinicaltrials.gov in the U.S. and the uh, emerging UDRAC system in Europe. 
uh, we plan, ACRO plans to do some further research, including focus groups to come up with some comprehensive recommendations on how these platforms can be uh, enhanced and improved and made more valuable and accessible for patients, for doctors, uh, and for other researchers who want to mine the data for other research purposes. We've seen a, a need there as well. So in summary, um, here are our set of, of policy recommendations. Uh, if you want to carry any of these to the Hill with you next week, um, we, we're looking for greater harmonization of regulations. Uh, we're looking to address the liability issues and make it clear for researchers that uh, they do not have uh, a great deal of liability. We're looking for a balanced approach on conflict of interest and, and income disclosure so that we do not discourage uh, participation in research to, to the detriment of, of medical innovation. We're looking for uh, insurance coverage for participants and then really expanding and improving the access uh, um, to online information. So um, we don't want to put all the burden on the regulators and the legislators. There's a lot of uh, an educational component here, too, for industry, but um, these are our policy recommendations. So with that, I will turn this back over uh, to James, and we can move on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Doug and John. Uh, with that, we will turn things over to Dr. Susan Love, who will give us a sh presentation on uh, her experiences and the Army of Women. Um, so I want to make one comment about the previous one. As a physician, I think that I think income disclosure is very important, and I think doctors not wanting to disclose their income from clinical trials is um, self-serving and not in the interest of the public. So uh, I say that as an as a physician and a researcher, um, that we the patient deserves to know how much the doctor and the institution is getting in, to perform the research. Now, moving on, direct to consumer recru recruiting. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Love Avon Army of Women, which is a program of the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation. Um, I, let's see, if not, I just want to go on. There we go. Our mission at the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation is to eradicate breast cancer and improve the quality of women's health through innovative research, education, and advocacy, and we accent the innovative part. Our goal is to identify barriers to research, to explore new approaches, and create new solutions, and we hope we're doing that. We're working to move breast cancer beyond a cure through innovation and collaboration. A lot of attention has been paid on finding the cure, but I think if we could find the cause, it would be even better. Um, the common goals, I think, of all of the organizations that are on this panel um, are really to accelerate research that will address clinical problems and really get us to answers. A lot of the research that is done and is funded by the government is um, basic research, which maybe eventually, if everything goes right, might turn into something. Um, but uh, not enough, I think, is actually um, trying to solve clinical problems. In the old days, doctors' clinical problem went back to the lab and figured it out and then went back to the clinic. You can't do that anymore because life is too complicated, but that means you've got researchers investigating interesting things to them that may or may not have applications in the clinic or trying to then find applications in the clinic. So the old model is really this investigator-initiated research. It's letting the, the scientists come up with interesting ideas, get funding, and do it, and maybe one of them will work out to be clinically relevant. An alternative model, and I don't think it's one or the other, but I do think we need both, um, is for um, nonprofit-initiated, facilitated research. So research where really advocates or the public are coming up with these are the issues we think need to be addressed, and then trying to facilitate that kind of research or make it happen. And that's the arena um, where the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation tends to play, although we are exploring some interesting scientific things as well. Um, the problem is how to do this, how to accelerate it, how to initiate it, how to facilitate it. And there's a number of ways to do it, um, ex making accessible biospecimens, accessible data, um, but this particular panel is accessible clinical trial participants, um, and I think it's important to mention early on because it's one of the differences, I think, between some of the groups in the Genetic Alliance and what we do in the, in the um, breast cancer world 
is that there is some difference between chronic diseases and acute diseases in terms of clinical trials and how to access people for them. So if you look at the problem, and, and I like to see things visually, uh, we've got the public, which are presumably healthy, then they become a patient because they're diagnosed with a disease of some kind, then um, you go to the the uh, medical, they get go to the medical enterprise or whatever uh, and get into that horrible system, and then hopefully we can get the medical enterprise to do research, and that's what we just heard about in the previous talk. Um, and then the nonprofits are out here raising money and trying to raise awareness, but have not in the past been that involved in research. Um, one model that, that more and more nonprofits are taking on, and particularly nonprofits are involved in chronic um, diseases, are uh, where they are now collecting as a registry um, people who have the disease, maybe collecting specimens, and I know this is being done a lot through Genetic Alliance, um, that will accelerate or make research more accessible. So now we have the public becomes a patient, and, and the patient becomes part of the nonprofit. And then the nonprofit interacts um, with the medical enterprise um, and with the researchers in pharma, maybe by helping recruit, maybe by um, giving them specimens to work on, maybe by trying to incentivize them, even with finances, in order to do research. Another model, and this is the model that that we're using um, is is to go directly to the public. So now we still got the public can become a patient or not, but if you recruit the public before their patients when they really don't have a problem or a disease, then um, to a nonprofit, then you have the opportunity to catch them um, at the time of diagnosis or much earlier in the process. So in a chronic disease where you're just trying out different drugs to treat a chronic disease, it probably doesn't matter when you catch them. And the previous registry model works pretty well. But if you want to try new drugs to treat breast cancer, uh, try something that's going to prevent Alzheimer's before you get too far along, before you're diagnosed, then you need to get earlier in the process. And then a model like this makes more sense. So here we actually, you notice I faded out, and I guess as a doctor I can do this, the medical enterprise is just getting them out of the loop because I think doctors are the problem in clinical research, and I think that by keeping them in the center, uh, it just makes things hard. If we can get them out of the way, they don't want to necessarily, in spite of what they they said in your great survey, I think participating in research and getting your patients in research is more work for them, takes too much time, um, and interferes with their standard way of operating. And so. Instead of trying to convince them, I just say let's get them out of the way and let's recruit directly to the researchers, either from the nonprofit or from the, the public and the patient. It's a different model. So the registry model, specific recruitment, you get everybody who has Alzheimer's, MS, something like that. Currently recognized risk factors, uh, people with the disease. Uh, it's a database then for matching. There's a, 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 a group called breastcancerclinicaltrials.org where you can go on and put all your information about your breast cancer and it will help you match um, clinical trials. But this really only works for clinical trials. I mean, most people don't do it early on. They might do it for metastatic disease. The problem is the database needs to be kept current and it's limited. The questions you ask, the data you collect is limited to what's known today because you don't know what questions to ask about tomorrow. You can have a biobank, but again, the biobank is limited to the technology of today. So you collect everything with the technology we know about now, and then maybe in three years they have a new test, but the trouble is the specimen has to be kept in alcohol instead of saline. And you collected all your specimens in saline because that was how it was at the time you collected them. And they're no use for the new test. So that is a limitation of of storing specimens. On the other hand, specimens are only available at certain points in time, so you've got to get them when you can get them. The limitations, it's expensive, it's a lot of work, and it may preclude discovering new information because you've only collected information based on what's known today. So it's, it's like the old, the, the recent story with ulcer disease where, where certainly when I was a cert operating and training as a surgeon, Ulcers were caused by acid, acid caused ulcers. All the questions we asked were about uh, ulcers and were about acid. 
And then this guy in, you know, Australia figured out that it was a bacterial infection. Well, we didn't ask any questions about bacterial infections because that wasn't in our mindset. So the problem with the registry and, and collect databases is you tend to ask the questions of what you're thinking about now, and you don't ask the questions um, that, that you don't know about. Um, and open, and then the owner, the benefit is also you own it. So if it's a nonprofit uh, based on a disease, a chronic disease like MS or, or um, ALS or any of these, then the ownership, uh, you can own it, and that gives you some leverage to make the, the pharmaceutical companies and the researchers do research because you can leverage what you have to make them pay attention to your disease. Another, the other model, though, and the one that we're exploring with the, in, in the foundation is an open database. So rather than recruiting a list of people with breast cancer, we're recruiting everybody. So we have women in the Army of Women, which I'm going to tell you about, who are healthy, free disease, that don't have disease, have disease, um, and every variation in between that are willing to be in research. So we don't really care about their medical history. We just care about their willingness. Um, it's really ends up being a broadcast email list. So we have the email list, and then we send, instead of trying to, to, to match people and, and have an involved computerized program to do that, we just send every study out to everybody, and then participants self-select. So you let them match based on their circumstances then. So you don't need to keep it current because the participants keep themselves current. It's adaptable to new hypotheses because we're not collecting um, da particular data. So if somebody suddenly comes out and says, oh, we think breast cancer is an infection, we can, suddenly, we can immediately start collecting data on infection. It's just in time tissue and fluid collection, so we don't store anything. We don't collect anything unless it's needed, and then we collect it in the way that it's needed. So that makes it more adaptable. There's no ownership, so that's a limitation. Um, and it, but it is less expensive, and it can accommodate both rare and common diseases because people don't have just one disease. People with breast cancer can also have a genetic problem, or they could have MS and have um, diabetes. So I think sometimes in, in the nonprofit world we get focused on one disease, and we forget that people actually often have more than one disease. So this is our model, this open database, and we got a generous grant from the Avon Foundation for, to start the Love Avon Army of Women. We encourage women to take the next step in breast cancer advocacy and actually participate in research. It gets women invested in the concept of research to find the answers. It forges a partnership between the women and the researchers to end breast cancer and increases the amount of research focused on the cause and prevention. It accelerates research by accessing, accessing a pool of ready volunteers and encourages researchers to study clinical important questions because they can get the people and the specimens that they need. We launched it about a year and a half ago, um, uh, and uh, we have now 335,000 women um, are, and some men. Uh, men are allowed to be in the Army of Women, but I told them I wouldn't change the name. Uh, and they sign up online, and any of you on the webinar can sign up. Go to www.armyofwomen.org, and we won't ask you a lot of information. What you're really signing up is to receive email announcements of available studies. If you fit a study and you want to be in it, you are a CP, and then we do a secondary screen online, and then we pass your names on to the researchers. Researchers who want to participate or want to use the Army and will do for-profit or not-for-profit, we don't discriminate, um, submit their studies online at the same website, www.armyofwomen.org. Um, we send them to our scientific advisory committee. If they've been peer-reviewed already, we don't peer-review them again. Uh, we just review them for the relevancy to our audience, and we want to not do stupid research. Um, and then if they haven't been peer-reviewed, then we do peer-review them. Um, we get um, help them get IRB approval for online recruiting, and then we send it out. At this point, we have 335,000 women, a little over that, recruited. Um, 80,000, 80% 80 of them are healthy, and that was very interesting to us because when we went out, we thought we would have mostly breast cancer survivors, but the majority of people in the Army of Women have not had breast cancer yet, um, uh, and they are not even high risk. 
20% are survivors. Um, we've launched since in a year and a half 31 studies uh, for researchers. 16 of them were closed, many of them within a week, sometimes within 24 hours. Uh, six studies, um, we recruited everybody they needed, and they said, well, that was so easy. Um, we're going to increase the number we need so we'll have more statistical power because we had only calculated the minimum number of people that could be in this study to allow us to find an answer, but if we can get people this easily, we'll do more. So we have six that are still open because they got so excited. I mean, we had one where uh, it was an online questionnaire. They needed 1,000 women, and in 12 hours we had 5,000 women crash their server. Um, another one needed women who were breastfeeding and could give them breast milk, and they thought it would take six years to recruit 250 women. We recruited 250 women within six months, and they've now increased it to 1,000 women. Um, one of the reasons we always send everything to everybody is, is that kind of study. We send the breastfeeding study to the 80-year-old woman because she may not be breastfeeding, but her granddaughter could be breastfeeding or her neighbor or somebody at church. So every time we send out a e-blast, it gets virally sent out further, and it increases our reach. So our reach becomes not just the 335,000 women that we have in the Army, but everybody they know, the people they send jokes to over the email, and their family and friends. Um, for advocates and half our um, scientists, we work with both AACR, the American um, uh, uh, cancer research um, found American College of Cancer. No, I'm missing a word. But anyway, the Cancer Research Foundation, uh, also the National Breast Cancer Coalition. We have put soldiers around the country with about 800 of them that help us recruit more women for the Army um, and more people uh, for studies. And we have regular PR and blog mentions and and try to keep it out there. And I did I. And sorry, um, yes. And so that's a what I wanted um, to do briefly this morning is give you a vision of another way to do things. So one way is the one we just heard about, and that is the standard way, and it works pretty well, particularly for studies that where patients have to be on a doctor's under a doctor's care. But there are many studies where you don't have to do that. Even drug studies where. Um, uh, you can you could do the whole study um, through the whole country um, online or by mailing the whatever you want the person to take. And there are other studies we 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 recruit for local studies as well where the people can show up at a certain center or a certain place. Um, I think that our experience has shown that the public is eager to participate in research and will um, step up to the plate when asked. In fact, the biggest complaint we get from the members of the Army of Women are not that I haven't had a study that fits me yet or there are not enough studies for me. And I think very often the problem is the physician is going through the medical enterprise and the physicians, and I, again, I say that as a physician, um, and if we can get them out of the way and go directly to the public, I think we can accelerate um, research into a lot of diseases uh, much faster. So with that, I will stop. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we'll turn things over to our last speaker. I do want to remind uh, attendees that you can type in questions in the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If we do not get to all the questions today, we will work with our speakers to get your questions answered um, and get those answers back to you so that you can be prepared for the next day on the Hill next week. Um, so with that, we'll turn things over to Jamie Haywood, uh, co-founder and chairman of Patients Like Me. And Jamie, I'll let you know when we can uh, see your slides. Great. Actually, uh, is, it, is it showing now or? Um, we can see your screen, uh, though we're seeing uh, the internet window for the GoToWebinar. Okay. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? So unfortunately, I have two screens open, and I would rather show the other screen because it's going to be too high resolution. But what I'll do is I'll just swap this over. Can everyone see that? In full, in, in, is it, is, can you see the whole thing now? Uh, yes, we can, yes, we can see the Patients Like Me website. Is it, is it, so that's viewable and you can, and it's, you can read the text, okay. So, uh, 
Uh, you know what I'm going to do? Actually, I'm going to swap. Let's see what happens. I'm going to stop showing and then bring it up again real quick, and then let me see if I can get this to go to the right scale. I think this is going to work better if I do this differently. Um, all right. Now let's try it. All right. That's better. Does that look better? Um, it's still relatively high resolution. Um, well, should have. Should have still using. I, I went back to just the laptop screen, but if that's, I, I, unfortunately, I can't see what you're seeing. But I can give you the view here. Uh, let, let me just start, and because I want to talk more rather than show uh, slides and data. Um, I, so first up, I. I I actually think it's a great panel, and I agree uh, with everything that everyone has said so far. Um, I want to touch on a couple of issues that I, I think Susan hit more of, but are um, I think we really don't speak to enough, which is the, the, the distrust of patients of the clinical research system. And, um, and I think at some level, some real, uh, you know, genuine dishonesty about misalignment of goals that, that really have driven um, uh, some problems here. And I just want to throw some words out, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what I, what I think we're trying to work towards, which is the integration of clinical care and research, so that this distinction goes away from. But, you know, when I think about what I would want to have with someone that was trying to either learn from me or uh, try an experiment that could benefit either potentially me or people that I care about. But, you know, I'm looking for words that like trust goals, which you know I think we're along the context of uh, Susan's talk about you know making clinical care better, learning how to make it better, and. And I think there's a great deal of ignorance on both sides here, which is sort of a, 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 an ignorance about the actual process of how we figure out what we should do in healthcare on the, on the part of the participants, um, and to some degree, as part of the healthcare system itself. And then secondly, on the, on the participants, there's sort of um, an ignorance which comes up across as entitlement, which is, you know, this is of interest to me and so therefore should be of interest to the patient. And when I hear from patients, I don't hear words like trust or respect or participation. I hear um, informed consent being used as kind of an abusive concept, which means that, you know, I, and I, I've talked about this in a few meetings, which is informed consent really has more to do with um, uh, ensuring that you can't sue me rather than actually that I know what's going on. And, uh, you know, and the experience I've heard told of people literally being read and then being forced to sign that the doctor read them a document over two hours to participate in a study. And, and the absurdity of that and the, you know, the inability to dialogue about that. So that, that, that doesn't either deal with respect or trust. And then um, really this, word, this, this use of the word subject, which, which comes out to the patient as um, lack of participation, because participation is a two-way dialogue, which involves, you know, even words as much strong as subjugation. These are words that we hear from patients, which is that, you know, you're doing this research and yet you won't tell me what you've learned about me. In fact, almost all IRBs ban the feedback of data. And I think that fails to, I think that, that, that engenders distrust um, and engenders misunderstanding. And and, and those things are things we really need to fix um, to sort of address getting patients to participate more in the clinical trial system. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, I think at some level, you know, we, we talk about information barriers as a problem, but I think there are genuine trust barriers that, that, that the research system itself needs to address before it can um, really begin to ask more of people. Uh, I'm going to touch on one more point on that, which is, you know, um, my, some, some, a group of us founded an organization called Health Data Rights, which basically asserts that if there's any information about health, my health, that I have a right to a copy of that information. And as far as I can tell, it's that simple right that I have the right to know something you might know about me, whether that be genetic or, or phenotypic or, or something else, that that information um, can't belong, that information belongs to me, and therefore I have a right to have a copy of it, not even an exclusive right. And, and basically clinical trials are, um, are, are essentially 
violating that and that they don't allow that information to happen. And I think that engenders mistrust. So let me let me talk a little bit about what I think is almost another extension beyond where uh, Susan is going towards. Um, and, I, and I think ultimately every individual is unique and every variable about every individual is unique and we're trying to find the best way to treat them. And, and one would imagine a system where every person in it had all of their variations and their, you know, their context against everyone else with the disease operated on in real time and that everyone participated in donating their data to a commons so that we learned what happened. And if I you know, give an example of this, this is our, our main website where people share the information. And what we're trying to do here is allow someone, and I'm just going to pick this patient that's had ALS for one year, um, that's a public patient, and they're donating their data to a data commons. This involves the progression over the last year um, which is very aggressive to the disease. They're in the fastest 5%. You can see the quality of the data we have, which includes, you know, increasing inability to use your arms and, and walk, and now ultimately at this point, um, inability to walk and speak and breathe and use your arms. Declining breathing ability, weight changes, the drugs they take for those uh, different, um, for, for managing their disease. You can look at um, the symptoms they experience, the procedures they've had, so this is an integrated data record. Then you can look at how they manage the question. So, you know, they, they treat their constipation with uh, Benefiber or insomnia they treat with Ambien and Mazepan. And these treatments are integrated in here and they're donating this data. And this produces sort of this rich environment where if I'm interested in looking at uh, a treatment like insomnia and I click on it, you can see in this patient data on roughly, you know, this, this report, data on roughly um, 13,000 people with insomnia, the treatments they use for it. You can look at the individuals taking it. And this is what, this is, for us, this is just simultaneously a research process that integrates the care and the research and allows you to discover new things. And, you know, we have a number of publications about new discoveries that are coming out of this. But more importantly, when you go to the questions that people want to know, for instance, you know, I'm interested in, uh, let's say we want to do a study of the side effects of, um, let's pick one of our more common uh, prescription drugs, Baclofen, which has a number of different utilities. You know, you can drill in this site and we could immediately survey, uh, you know, over 2,500 people who've used it, who are currently on this drug, that have already done a, a, participated in the research process about it, and or um, uh, and, and we could ask a particular dose group or particular information, or we could ask the 320 people that have stopped taking it. So this information allows for rapid integration of research. And I think ultimately many of the queries should be automatic so that it would become a learning system and, and it's, you know, we're capable of doing this. Now, what, I, what we find out of this is that the participants who are participating in this data gathering exercise of the research when they come to trials, come to it with an expectation of participation and an expectation that they know what they're doing, that they're adding value to something new. And I think this is a, you know, an education learning process that really makes the participants able to really become part of the infrastructure. I'm going to throw one other comment out that I think, um, I think Susan addressed uh, as well, which is the shift from sort of investigator to institutional, um, uh, you know, nonprofit or corporate um, uh, objectives. You know, the, the questions that we have in health are, are, are not really questions that should be driven by a, uh, you know, investigator-initiated science as much as we really have fundamental questions about how to manage disease, comparative effectiveness on drugs. And those are really, you know, to my mind, large-scale institutional science problems. And what you really need is you need a, a strong committee that can design an excellent study. And you need a, an active group of participants that understand, you know, the objectives and the goals and the consent process. And those things need to intersect. And the role of the investigator, who is the doctor, who sits between the patient and the study environment, really becomes more and more of a commodity. And, and they should be paid essentially only for delivery of a certain quality set of data in that environment, and that we should institutionalize this infrastructure where the participants directly deal 
with the with the with the the, the, the institution that cares about the result, whether that be you know the the, the uh, a, a breast cancer nonprofit or an ALS nonprofit or you know a pharmaceutical company that wants to test a new drug. That, that the honesty of that direct relationship and the outcome goals will enhance and and, lo- and, and increase the trust. So I, I, I worry less about um, getting investigators to participate because I think essentially they're just fee-for-service parts of the system. I worry more about ensuring that there is a, a well-characterized and understood population of patients that want to be participants, shared participants in the research process itself as part of their clinical care and achieving their own goals. Um, and I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, I, we did receive a number of questions. I'm going to ask the two very specific targeted questions first, and if we could keep those answers really short, and then we'll go on to them. Um, so the first one is for Jamie, and it's just a question that you said about, you had talked about a patient's right to health, and they asked, is that a document that uh, the participants can get access to? Uh, well, so, 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 the, 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 so, so the organization is called Health Data Rights, and the, the web address is healthdatarights.org, um, and, and it asserts, uh, and we could, you could actually just go to it on your screen, but it, it asserts, uh, um, uh, you know, four, four basic principles, which are, you know, you have a right to your health data, um, and, and there's an ability to Point, you know, learn more information, um, but but the the but, but but the I think the action here is about encoding this in law. Um, you know, how do we uh, change the the state laws that prevent labs from being given to a patient? How do we change um, the academic obsession is the right word with secrecy, where IRBs prevent genetic data from being handed back to participants? Um, in this sort of terrible, and actually literally it's the most subjugating concept I can imagine, which is that, 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 that there's this concept that human beings cannot handle information, that somehow that is an adverse event. And I think those kinds of things are what we need to change. And this really becomes about fundamentally a human right to not have two classes of individuals. Um, I've over-answered that. As you can tell, I care a lot about the topic. <laughs> That's okay. You know, um, can I just jump in for a second? I, I think I totally agree with you, Jamie, about about the right to all your health and medical information. I think where and I think where the where the line gets fuzzy and where the IRBs, I think I, I agree, go overboard, is when people are doing basic um, exploratory research and they don't know what the results mean, and then when you share them. Um, with people they with the public um, before really anybody has any clue if they mean anything, it can be very confusing and I think what happens is where that may be not something that you, you where you really have you know the very early um, um, kind of research where you might not want to share it, but the IRBs have extended that to unless you know all the way out um, as you say to to genetic information, information where we have a clue what it means, but we may not be sure. I, I, so I agree with that, I, but I think that the trick there is that what we're really discussing is a hypothetical harm um, mm-hmm. versus, you know, a, a human right, you know, and 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 a, and a creation of a class system and creation of distrust. And 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 the part about that that I, you know, what it reminds me of, and, and you know, if you remember the early days of you know WebMD and the the backlash to the idea that a, that a patient could, you know, learn anything about a disease, and right. you know, and and, the, yeah. and 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 how terrible that was. And then someone went out and actually measured: Has the internet ever caused any injury? That was the question, right? Mm-hmm. And and you know, as far as I can tell, and I don't think the data is updated as of a couple of years ago. There has been one case where information on the internet, you know, contributed to a significant adverse event in health. Mm. And I think that, that you know, I, yeah, I, I would me. find. I mean, I know of many cases in my own experience, but but I still don't think that. Well, but, but, but was that the internet, or was that, or was that other sources? I mean, so you have to be careful about that. But yes, 
So, but but I think you're but I think you're right. I mean, cars also kill people, and we let people drive. I mean, it's not. But but what would have to happen is, and what the medical profession is not willing to do, and then we should shut up and answer other people's questions. But <laughs> is is that um, is to explain things. So what you what what you have to do is you don't just hand them the information. You have to hand them the information in the context. And and so you you know and so the fact that you don't want to give the context is not an excuse to not give the information. Perfect. Absolutely agree. Excellent. Um, so I do want to involve ask a higher level question to as that's a very high level answer, <laughs> um, but I want to ask a question too that involves I think Doug and John's perspectives as well. The la and I think this is going to be our last question for today just because we're running out of time. And that is, you know, we talked a lot about both from the public and for clinical investigators the idea that there needs to be this, this general participation based upon lots of information and trust and um, kind of an understanding of context. But there is the reality of that in this country currently the – participation rates are extremely, extremely low. There's a long way to go. And there isn't really a culture of participation in, in the United States around understanding of why to participate in clinical trials or even kind of an awareness that that's um, kind of a, a public service in a way or a personal service, um, depending on how you look at it. Can the speaker, I think starting with Doug, because uh, he hasn't had a chance to answer any specific questions yet, um, Doug and John, talk a little bit about do we need a big change there? Is it possible in, in the United States? Because a lot of people do argue, you know, without um, with their current health care system that, that that is a huge barrier. Um, and then how do we create it? And we do only have a little bit of time left, but I think we can go, a, you know, a little five, ten minutes over um, if the speakers are willing. But I also understand that there are time constraints if our speakers need to uh, jump off the phone. Very good. Well, thanks, James. So it's, it's, it's Doug Pettacord. And I really like your, your phrase around the culture of participation. And I think we really do view this as, as a culture of participation for both um, patients or participants or individuals. And I agree with Jamie. I don't think it's ever appropriate to call people subjects. I think what they are are participants or volunteers or patients, but in any case, I think what they're not is subjects, though they are part of science. Um, in any case, I think your, your, your phrase around the culture of participation is, is, is an important one. I think it's a daunting process, I have to say, I, I, they're, they're, because I think it's largely about education, but I think it's also very much about access to information, and I think that's for both Jamie and Susan are really um, right on target in terms of the more people know about the, 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 the science of clinical trials and about the development of new treatments, the more likely they are to participate if there is indeed a culture of trust, as Jamie talks about. So there's a, there's a sort of, there's a, there's a clear, you know, people need to know much more and we need to build a much stronger culture of trust. I think, again, as, as John illustrated, I mean, given where we are and given our kind of involvement, our level of involvement with the current medical system, we're, we're obviously looking a lot at investigators, at physicians, as well as at patients and participants. Um, I think, on the other hand, that's the, the, there's no either or here in terms of, of sort of the models. Susan and Jamie have talked about. I think they are, they both hold enormous promise um, for 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 the future. Um, it's a really big task. I know we um, look at CISGRIP, the Center for Information and Study on Clinical Research Participation, as a nonprofit that's very much involved in education and and sort of moving the ideally moving the needle around that culture of participation. Um, but it's a it's a I have to say, it is a daunting task. The numbers are not good for either the the, the investigator, physician, or, or patient participant side. I think that's where 
you know, we're very excited about about the kinds of programs that that Susan and Jamie and others are are, are involved in because I think they're really about mobilizing the patient side of that. And I think that you know we need to drive demand from that side, not simply from the from the investigator side. Can I just throw two cents in, and then I, I, I'm going to have to leave. Um, one thing I think it gets in the way, certainly of clinical trials for acute diseases, which I think is a harder. The chronic diseases are a little bit easier because they're accessible over a period of time. But the but if you want to try a new breast cancer uh, drug, you need to get them at the time they're diagnosed. Is that you're asking people to be in a study at the same time you're diagnosing them with a disease and they're scared to death and the last thing they're going to do, they want to do is, is even um, acknowledge that maybe all the answers aren't in and that their doctor isn't God. Um, and I'm hoping that by the model of the Army of Women where we're involving people in research when they're not diseased yet, don't have diseases and they have practice being in research over time, that then when they're diagnosed, the first thing they're going to say is, where's the study? As opposed to, because that's what they know and are comfortable with and a, and a culture they're comfortable with, much the way it is in pediatric oncology. Um, but I think part of the education has to be not at the time that you're diagnosed, because that's too scary. It's got to be much sooner. Yeah, you know, uh, I want to reflect on what I find all my emails with a quote from Archimedes, which is, to measure is to know. And I, I, reflecting exactly on what Susan just said, um, we need to train people that if the doctor or the medical system, I don't even want to say doctor, if the medical system that they are interacting with, that is either diagnosing or managing or looking at them, is not measuring that patient in some ongoing, you know, either quality or research or other process, then they don't know. And in fact, some level, I would raise it to the point that they're committing malpractice. And if we create that culture, mm -hmm. then the measurement and the participation and the contribution of each individual um, becomes part of the health system as opposed to this separate, you know, disconnected commercial enterprise that, 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 that leaves both the health system starved of the data that could make it work and the research system starved of the data that could actually eliminate the creation of new value and, and, and innovations. Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I love what you just said. I think that's exactly right. Um, and, and we need to make measurements, which is really what research is, part of the culture of medicine, which it is not now. Excellent. And I think that's the, really the beginning of an answer to a very large question. And trials and where we can go. I do want to remind everyone that the final webinar in this series, uh, Proceeding Genetics Day on the Hill, will focus on the testing oversight and will take place on Thursday, July 13th at noon, or Tuesday, July 13th at noon Eastern Standard Time. Um, and with that, I want to conclude today's webinar and thank all of our speakers and our participants. Um, and I hope to see everyone at Genetics Day on the Hill next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.